I've been doing a lot of work recently involving characters. I haven't had as much time to make in-depth tutorials on actual materials, and that's kind of what I've known for at the current time. But I think it's time for a little more broad approach, a couple handful tips that I use daily to increase the quality of all my work. And I've, I've taken the time to really figure out the easiest to implement and the fastest to learn. And hopefully this handful of tips really helps you out. Welcome back everybody, my name is Gamma Trap, one word. And today we're going to be going over a handful of tips and tricks and things to keep in mind to make your work stand out a little bit more, to make it just a little bit more presentable, to make it a little more professional and to make it a little easier on you. So let's get started. So these are some things that I keep in mind with all of my artwork and all of my projects. And it doesn't matter what size the project is, doesn't matter how many pieces are in the project, doesn't matter what style the project is in, because I work in a variety of styles. One of the main things is you always want to keep in mind of the space, the overall space of the piece. When I first get started on a piece, I usually start way zoomed out, way out, so you can see everything at a glance and get the basic overall feel. And then over time, you zoom in a little while you work. And now you'll notice that I did most of this one probably zoomed out about here. Because if you zoom in, you'll see it's it's just a bunch of messy brushes, a bunch of undetailed loose brushes, just like, just like this. And the brush that I'm using here right now is actually one of my brushes. I call this one brick because it looks like a brick. <laughs> it's very simple. It's textured, it's kind of gritty, but it's got a bit of structure to it so I can do some of those more finer lines that I like to do from time to time. You can find it on my gum road down below as uh, along with a couple other brushes of mine like ash and burnt. But tip number one is always start zoomed out and slowly work your way closer. The longer the piece goes on, the more you're going to want to zoom in. You don't want to start too zoomed in too quickly. Another helpful tip is of course, to keep in mind the values. Now you'll hear me and a bunch of other art YouTubers and teachers and people who make art tutorials, you'll hear us talk about values and value control. And I'm gonna break that down for you into a very simple, easy to understand formula. Let's say you wanted to make a shape. If we paint the shape the same color as the background, you'll notice over here, you could barely see it. You could barely see it at all. You can see it a bit right here, but that's only because the circle is slightly lighter than the background. But most of this, especially if you zoom out, is almost completely invisible. So to change the values is to make a thing stand out from what it's in front of. So when we bring up something like value control or to think about your values, what we're talking about is the light and dark of things in the piece. This ear on the headpiece is darker than the background so you can see it better. The fingers on this hand are darker so you can see it much easier than everything else. When something blends into the background, say for example, this spot right here, technically speaking, these feathers are in the foreground so they should look darker like this because when they're the same color as the background, we don't know that they're there. We can't see them. If you hear an art teacher or somebody say a tangent, what they mean is something flowing into another. So when someone's having a, going on a tangent vocally, like in a conversation, it means that that conversation is moving from one point into another, usually uh, on accident. Like it's a, a side thought that they just kind of like, oh yeah, speaking of, you know, and then they start moving into that part of the conversation. That works the same way visually. So if the values look roughly like the same as other values that are at different points, different focal areas, for example, back here is the background and over here is the foreground, you can't tell. They don't look different. One of the main things you'll need to focus on is to make sure that there are as little tangents as possible. You don't want things blending into each other. So far, I've worked about two and a half hours on this piece. I work pretty fast and it's not very detailed, as you can see. There's just enough detail that you understand roughly what's going on in the piece. If you zoom into a random part in this piece, you can't really tell what's going on. You need to focus on what's important. Most of the time is spent on the main points in the piece. The main focal points are the head, the fire, in the hand. Everything else is sort of secondary or background noise or just fluff or filler even. You want to get your basic idea in 
the basic shape fast. You want to get that in quickly in the beginning of the piece. And then as time moves on, you want to spend most of your time in the areas that matter, in the areas that will receive the most attention. Now, part of the ways we can do this is by separating them with two things. Light, dark values, you want to make them the highest contrast in terms of values, but also the highest contrast in terms of color, the highest saturation. You'll notice most of this is actually a very low saturated, near gray even. Whereas the closer we get to, you know, the, the highest saturation points, one of the main focal points, our little dot here moves further to the right. If the ball is farther left, then we know that it is a low saturation, almost black and white, pre pretty gray, in fact, um, color. But as we move closer to the focal points, you'll notice that the ball bounces much further to the right more often. And that's because we want to make sure that the main, I'll put this right here. <laughs> we want to make sure that the main focal points get the most contrast, the most difference between light and dark, meaning we want pure white and as close to pure black as we can, very close together. Like for example, on the underside of the beak, we've got lights and darks very close together uh, on these focal areas. And over here, there's, there's some of that and then some of this. They're not that different. They're very similar. There's not too much stark cutting between all oh, that is very bright and that is very dark. But if you are going to include pure white, you probably want it to be in one of the main focal areas. Same with pure black. Now, I don't think I have any pure black on this piece, but I might, let's see. That's pretty close, that's pretty dark. The darkest point you also want to be, most likely the most focal area. The farther away things get, you want them to be the most soft. You want them to have low contrast. They are not the things that you want people to focus on. The human eyes tend to gravitate towards things with the highest amount of contrast. So things that are more in focus tend to have more contrast. You can do this with photography. If you take your phone and have it select something, it will automatically zoom in until it finds the perfect focal length and you'll notice that everything else that's not in focus is much softer. And that's just a natural thing that human eyes naturally do. Not to mention just actual like photographs and how we handle camera focus. So we wanna emulate that in our work. And next, you also wanna focus on how much time is spent. This piece so far has taken me about two and a half hours currently. I might do a little extra work on this, but at the moment, it's only about two and a half hours spent on this whole thing. And the majority of the time, I would say almost half, if not more than half, has been spent on just these small areas. I know it's very tempting to start with a small brush and then over time, increase the size of the brush to cover more areas as maybe you get more impatient, but you need to probably start with a much bigger brush much sooner. And then as time goes on, decrease the size of your brush to be much smaller so that you can do those small details, those minor details, the, the dings and cuts and metal and the little sparks and flame and things like that that really give people's eyes something to focus on. It's a little flavor, you know? You wanna make sure that the highest detail spots are just in those areas of focus. And when you're sitting there thinking, oh, I don't know what the area of focus is gonna be, how would I know that? Think about you. Just step away from yourself just for a bit and imagine as if you weren't the one drawing. Imagine you're not the person who's making the piece. Imagine you're looking at it as someone just imagining, just in your mind's eye. Imagine you're just a fresh face and you have no idea what it is. What would you focus on, you know? <laughs> if there's a hand, if there's a face, usually we focus on those things. As people, if it's an animal, usually, again, it's the, it's the head. Next, try and work on the entire piece at once. You'll notice I have two different windows here that are open. Whenever I do something on one, it appears in the other. So if I zoom in and start working on this piece, I might be focusing on these small details, but I can always see what's going on in the overall piece because if I add one of these little numbers or do anything, I can see it. Now let me just show you how to do it real quick. Uh, it, you could do this in multiple programs, but right now, because we're in Photoshop, let's just do it here. You go to Window, Arrange, and then at the very bottom, it says new window for, and that's your Photoshop document's name. Click that. And now there's two 
different versions. And now we go back up to window and then arrange and you'll see right here to a vertical. This is a vertical piece, so I'm going to keep them vertical and that's what I like to do. And then you can just drag this over here and now you can just play around with this one and they're the exact clone. So if you do one thing to one, the second you lift up your brush, it'll pop up on over here. It's not a one to one real time, which that's a tragedy, but that's just how it is. Uh, this It's based off history markers, if that makes any sense to you, meaning that it's not going to track your exact brush because your brush, even though it's happening right now, isn't in the history tool. If you control Z without lifting up your brush while still doing this, nothing will happen. Uh, so if you lift up your brush, then it tells Photoshop that happened and then it writes that information down and it becomes part of your history. So if you control Z, then it actually does take it away. I'm um, hope hopefully that's not too complicated. The main point is doing this allows you to work side by side, even if you flip the canvas like I just did. And I flip the canvas constantly, by the way, it's another way of kind of refreshing your eyes to help you imagine you're not the one drawing it. Uh, if you want that fresh perspective, try and flip your canvas as often as you can. Besides, you might notice you're drawing your face slanted and skewed which is another fun, helpful tip. That one's for free. <laughs> you probably get tired of hearing that one, actually, if you've been watching many art YouTube tutorials. But doing this allows you to make cool changes and see the actual results on the entire piece to make sure there's no weird distractions and make sure that this, you're not accidentally making a tangent. You wanna make sure that everything you do on the piece makes sense for the overall quality of the piece. Making sure you can see the whole piece while you work is definitely a, uh, a plus. It's definitely a good idea. And I work professionally, I've been working professionally for years uh, with studios and things like, even I still do this from time to time just to make sure that everything's on track. And I'm pretty sure doing this was one of the reasons I was able to make this kind of piece so quickly. Again, this is only about two and a half hours. Is this the most impressive piece I've ever done in two and a half hours? No, no, it's not. But I would say that it is a pretty decent one. <laughs> I, I, I'm actually really proud of this one. I like it, you know, because it follows all those little tenants that I was telling you about. Now, if you are impressed by the fire that I've made in this short amount of time, because I didn't actually spend that much time on this fire, but I'm actually, uh, you could say I'm pretty well practiced in making fire. I have an entire playlist on how I paint fire and there's, and it shows two different types. It shows stylized fire and then it shows more realistic fire. And this is the more realistic fire, believe it or not. And if I had more time to spend on this piece, I would definitely make this fire much cooler, much more, you know, flame-esque. But I had just a little bit of time. If you would like to know how to do this in a short amount of time, very quickly, I would recommend going to watch one of the fire tutorials. But hopefully those little tips were useful, helpful, and or entertaining. Leave a like if you liked it, dislike if you dislike it, subscribe to see more. Thank you so much for stopping by. And leave a comment saying what you would like like to know more of what style you would like to see. I have a, a vast bank of, of information, a wealth of information, you could say, on these topics. So thanks so much for coming by, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.